Investor intelligence provides general information only. You should consider seeking independent advice to see how this information relates to your unique circumstances. Please refer to the terms and conditions available at investorintelligence.com.au for more. Welcome to this week's episode of Investor Intelligence, your weekly podcast on all things investment, hosted by me, Jacob Kearns. We all know communication is important for both our professional and personal lives. Misunderstandings can cause issues between us and other people around us. Today, I'm joined by Aaron Best, Member Experience Director, who recently ran a workshop on communication, different language styles, how to use your language to get your message across effectively, and how to understand that certain people may respond differently to a different type of language style. Hello, Aaron. Thank you for having me. So, Aaron. Can you run through why you ran that workshop and the importance of learning how to communicate effectively? Yeah, so at the Property Mentors, we are, as I've discussed on this podcast before, unlike buyers agents, we work with our members long term. We have to build an effective relationship with people and we do that with people all over Australia. So we're based here in Melbourne, um, but we work with a lot of people across the country. And so that means that a lot of our, our time with our members is spent talking over the phone or over video call. If we're lucky, our members might be in Melbourne and we get to see them or they come visit Melbourne and we ask them to come and have a coffee. But a lot of the time, our communication with them is over the phone. And so it's important that we are really thinking about what kind of rapport we're building with them, what kind of message we're getting across, because we're, we're asking these people to trust us to build property portfolios. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars. If we don't communicate effectively with that person, then that can cause issues with our relationship in the future. Right. So on that note, throughout the workshop, you covered that communication is more than just the words we say. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So studies have found that communication is, as you said, it's more than just the words that we're using. The the three factors that come into play with communication often are body language, tonality and the words we use and interestingly the statistics show that the words that you're using is it actually only represents about seven percent of getting your message across 55 percent of communicating is actually your body language and 38 percent if my maths is right (laughs) is uh is the tone that you use so it's really important that you are thinking about everything that you're doing how are you standing when you're speaking to someone and as you mentioned we do a lot of our communication over the phone which means we are losing more than half of our ability to communicate effectively with someone yeah so we have to be really mindful of the tone that we're using and the language that we're the the words that we are using and further to that when in, in most people's lives we're doing so much more communication over text and over email over text and email you're losing tone again so you're now literally just working with 7% of your arsenal trying to communicate with people. So it's really important to find ways to use your language effectively and to communicate really well. And with written communication, human language has evolved to include emojis, which help to convey tone when you can't. Yeah. So okay. it's it's become a really interesting thing to see how we've adapted. A hundred years ago, we didn't really communicate quite so much in writing as we do now because our only method of writing then was letters, whereas now we've got emails, text messages, social media to communicate through. Mm. So you touched on how it's important to learn how to use that 7%, your language effectively, but let's go back to the 55% body language. How can you learn to read what someone may be communicating through their body language and how can you influence your own to get your message across better? Yet, as humans, we're hardwired to respond to body language. If someone is closed off to us, if someone has body language that we just don't feel is quite right, we notice it. We may not immediately understand exactly what that body language represents, but we can feel that something is wrong. On top of that, humans tend to mirror each other's body language. So what you will often find is if you are being really closed off, the other person can go one of two ways. They'll either also be closed off because they feel like 
they want to be further away from you, or they may decide to fill the gap that you've provided. So if someone is being quite small and timid, another person in a conversation might be much more loud and boisterous because they're filling the gap that the other yeah, person okay. has created. And when it comes to body language, that can be whether you're standing with your arms crossed, whether you're standing with your hands on your hips, whether your feet are separated or together, even down to quite often a very strong sign of masculinity and control is standing with your feet and weight evenly distributed. Right. Whereas people who are a little bit more standoffish will often lean on one hip or the other. Okay. And that creates a more relaxed and casual and less powerful stance. Mm. Well, it's interesting you say that, you know, a lot of it we don't pick up on straight away. In doing my research for the podcast, I started to read about the different types of body language that other people used, which I found interesting that, you know, a lot of the communication happens and we don't actually realize it. But on a subconscious level, we are paying attention to those cues. That's a really good point. You may not realize exactly why you don't like someone or that you're not responding well to someone. And it could be because of their nonverbal cues. So nonverbals right. are really important to communication. And it might be that someone isn't making eye contact with you, or it might be that their body is turned slightly away from you. And so you don't feel like they're giving you their full attention. Yeah. And although it may not be something you're consciously aware of, subconsciously, you do respond to that and, and you change the way you feel about that person. Yeah. And when it comes to business and personal life and those sorts of things, we often talk about people do business with people they like. If you aren't communicating well with someone, if you're not paying attention to the way you're presenting yourself to someone and they are getting those non-verbals that make them feel less important to you or they don't engage with you very well, then they're less likely to want to actually engage with you in a professional way. Yeah. So it's just as important to understand how you're presenting to someone else as it is to understand what message someone is giving you through their non-verbal cues. Yeah. Something else you mentioned in the workshop was that there's four stages of communication and that what you say and how you communicate is only really 50% of the conversation. What did you mean by that? So whenever you are speaking with someone, there are four different ways that your conversation is understood. The first is what you think and what you think you're trying to say. And so that's what's happening inside your own head. And you then decide to choose words and say something. But quite often people, and it's common for everyone, that you can't get the right words out. So what you say isn't exactly the way you're thinking, right. but you're trying your hardest. Yeah. The third is what was heard. So the words that you said are heard by the next person and they take that information in and they, in their own head, translate that into thoughts that they understand. So that's the fourth uh, definition of that conversation is what they understood. And it's like a game of Chinese whispers. It can fall apart at any one of those points. What you said may not be exactly what you thought and what you said and what they heard, they may understand the words slightly differently. So what they think and feel and respond to the way you said it could completely change. And that's one of the basis of misunderstandings. People don't often go out of their way to offend or upset people, but the way that people inherently understand something because of their own lived experience can be different to what you meant it to be. And so it's important to understand when you are communicating with someone, not only what you were trying to say, but what you were trying to get them to understand. So instead of focusing on saying what you want to say, say what you want them to hear. Right. So as you mentioned, there's often a big discrepancy between what you initially think and then what the other person understands. How can you reduce that friction, I guess you could say, in terms of what you want the other person to understand and what you initially thought? One of the biggest things is active listening on both ends. So active listening is often touted as this thing that everyone needs to know. And it's all about paraphrasing and doing different things and verbal nods. So what is active listening? Active listening is trying to convey that you are understanding someone when you are communicating with them. Right. Some of the most common aspects of active listening are paraphrasing. So repeating back to someone what they're saying in different words or, or trying to say what you understood or what that person is communicating communicating to you or verbal nods, verbalizing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those kinds of yeah. um, sounds. And there are a few other different active listening techniques, but utilizing active listening can really help you to establish that you are communicating with someone and putting that back on someone to say, can you reiterate what have you understood of what I just said yeah. so that you can then hear back in their own words, what they understood. And you can see if there has been that breakdown of communication. Right. So, 
not just accepting that, oh, I said it the way I meant it, so it must have been understood because that's not always the case. Taking someone and asking them to re-establish that they comprehend what you said is also important. Mm. Again, uh, in my research for this podcast, I also read that when you are looking at someone's body language and trying to understand what they're communicating, that it's often wise to not look at body language on its own in a vacuum. So think about what someone is trying to communicate in the whole context. What are the words that they're saying and how the body language and tonality, as you touched on before, how does it all come together? Not just is someone turned away, maybe there's a particular reason for that. And often people use the example of if someone's arms are crossed, they're not receptive to what you're saying, but maybe they're just cold or maybe they're more comfortable resting their arms in that position. Yeah. In, in another life, I was studying forensics and and part of that was forensic psychology and one of the techniques that they taught you when you are dealing with people is to try and establish five things from five meters away so looking at someone establishing five different things you notice about them and deciding what could possibly be the reason for that and and coming up with all the different reasons, not just jumping to the first conclusion. So does someone walk with a limp? Why are they walking with a limp? Is it an injury or is it something more long-term? Is someone being short with you? Is it because they're hangry or is it because they don't like you? Thinking about all the different scenarios and not just jumping to the first conclusion. I know I've seen it a lot with various people and in particular it happens between couples and, and people who are quite close to each other emotionally, they will have quite emotive responses to the other person's behavior. And that can cause a breakdown in communication. I know I'm, I'm guilty of it as well, in that my friends, my family, my partner may say something in a certain way and they don't mean it that way, but I've taken it that way and I respond in kind. Yeah. And it can be really important to take a step back and go, am I misunderstanding the situation? Am I jumping to conclusion? Did they mean that the way I took it? And it could be, yeah, someone's got their arms crossed. Are they closed off from me or are they cold? Mm. Thinking about those kinds of things and not acting before you know what the actual reason was for something. And I think the biggest thing with that in communicating effectively and trying to understand what someone's communicating is a level of self-awareness. And you talked about that in the workshop as well, how your thoughts influence your feelings and your feelings influence your behavior. And again, in my research for this, I came across a term called cognitive restructuring, which means essentially being self-aware, picking up on negative thoughts when they arise and not engaging in them. You might say, I'm not a good public speaker, but you could reframe that as I have valuable insights to share and I can improve my public speaking. Yeah, I I really love this topic. One of my favorite things about cognitive behavioral therapy is that, as you mentioned, the thoughts that you have influence the feelings that you have influence the behaviors that you exhibit. And for a lot of people, understanding that thoughts and feelings are separate and that they aren't codependent. You can have a thought without it causing a feeling. You can have a a negative thought without getting sad. You can um, think that someone has slighted you without getting angry. Mm. It's understanding that there is a difference between your thoughts and your feelings and that they're not always tied together. And as you said, they've then got behavior. And the cognitive restructuring, the basis of that is that you can also work backwards. So people often say that if you're feeling a little bit stressed and anxious to meditate or do a breathing exercise, because that change in your behavior will help to influence your feelings and influence your thoughts. One of the most common ones is smile. It's really difficult to maintain a smile if you are angry, but to actually force yourself to smile kind of pushes your feelings and your thoughts in the correct direction. It helps you to reestablish control over your own mind and, and what's happening inside your head. A lot of people who suffer from stress and anxiety and those sorts of things, particularly in circumstances where you are making big decisions, like here at Property Mentors, people are buying property That's one of the biggest decisions you'll ever make in your life. Anxiety and stress can be a really big part in what our mentors deal with. Um, Our members may get stressed on the phone to their mentors. And so their mentors have to know how to control that situation and help that person come back and calm down. Performing actions, performing behaviors can help to reestablish control over your mind, your thoughts and feelings. Yeah. Here at The Property Mentors, We have decades of experience investing in property. We know what to look for and what kind of impact it can have on your portfolio. 
we have access to brokers, accountants, and property managers to make sure your portfolio performs. Visit thepropertymentors.com.au to learn more. In the workshop, you also covered confidence and how having confidence can greatly improve your communication. Are there any techniques you can use to increase your confidence? Confidence is a very interesting topic. It does have a lot to do with the way you communicate and the way you communicate also has a really big influence on how confident you're feeling and how confident you're coming across. There are two fairly common things that I really enjoy about the way that your communication style can influence your level of confidence, both perceived and felt. The first is things such as limiting language. Quite often people will use words like just or only to soften a sentence. You might say, oh, I just work in customer service or I Mm. just own one investment property. But you can take that word out of the sentence and the sentence is still the same. So you can say, I work in customer service or I own an investment property. It adds to the level of confidence in the sentence just naturally, both the way you feel saying the sentence, you feel a lot more confident saying that sentence. Mm. Sounds like more of an achievement Mm. rather than Than, adjust. Yes, exactly. And it also helps the other person listening to feel that confidence as well. Yeah. And you've done nothing except for remove an extra word. The other big technique that that comes with that is we've discussed how your body language can influence your behavior and things like smiling can make you feel happier and those sorts of things. And standing in a more powerful position can also help you feel more powerful and confident. People who stand making themselves feel small, their shoulders are slouched in, their back is rounded and they've got their hands in their lap, they will often feel less confident that someone sitting back in a chair, someone who has got their hands open, someone who's got their chest large and their shoulders out, that bringing of that strength to the way you're holding yourself will in turn make you feel stronger and more powerful and more confident. Mm. So it's important to understand exactly how the way you're communicating and those non-verbals, how that is impacting the way you think and feel and behave in your own right. So make small changes to the way you're holding yourself because it can help you feel more confident in your day-to-day life as well as make people see you as more confident. And it's interesting how you bring that up because we do, whether consciously or not, perceive people who aren't taking up as much space, maybe they're crouched over or hunched not only do they feel less confident but we see them as less confident as well exactly and if we see them as less confident we're less likely to believe in their abilities people who are confident are the people who we think yeah they're going to to do really well and that again comes down to our relationships that we've got with our members here at TPM. If we're not showing that we're confident in the decisions and the research that we're doing for a member, then why should that member trust that we know what we're doing? Mm. If they're going to be guided by us to help them build a multi-million dollar portfolio, Shouldn't they have confidence in us that we know what we're doing and that we're confident in what we're telling them? Yeah, absolutely. Is there any other language that might be useful in getting your message across? I think it can be really important when it comes to choice of words is understanding that certain words have certain connotations. Things such as the word why. Although it's a harmless word, a lot of people can feel really antagonized by it. So depending on the situation, if you are having quite an emotive conversation with someone, whether it be a partner or you're making a really big decision, being asked why can make people feel quite taken aback. Mm. So finding other ways of asking that question, like I personally will often, if I am trying to push someone for more information, I might say, how come? So they might say, oh, I'm... I'm not quite ready to get started on my property investment journey. And instead of going, why? I'll be like, how come? What makes you say that? Mm. It's a softer way of still getting the same information. Understanding that if you want someone to communicate effectively with you and you want to get your point across, choosing words that make them feel comfortable is more likely to have them respond positively to you than choosing words that make them feel attacked. Even though you don't mean to, it can have that connotation. Again, it comes back to the word that you said versus the word that was heard versus the way it was understood. Yeah. So the way you communicate and the way you understand others' communication obviously makes a big, big difference to your life and in both your personal relationships and your professional life, your career, job, etc. What can you do to improve your communication when it's something that's so deeply ingrained into us? 
For me, one of the things that I like to do is review what I'm doing. So I know that a lot of people will often keep a journal. Keeping a journal allows you to review how a situation occurred and what your response to it was and what your thoughts and feelings were. And taking the time to understand what your reaction to a situation was And if there is a breakdown in communication, being really honest with yourself and understanding where you might have played a part in the miscommunication, but also understanding how you can improve. Unfortunately, you can't make people change, but you can change yourself. When it comes to things like breakdown in communications and communicating more effectively, you're only in control of yourself, which means you have to take that step to do things yourself to change the outcome. Yeah. So it sounds like self-awareness is really important in understanding the way you communicate. And one of the methods that I've heard people use to analyze the way you communicate and the language you use is to record yourself speaking for five minutes, look at the filler words that you use and try to eliminate that in your communication. It can can help you communicate so much more succinctly and effectively. Well, thanks for your time today, Aaron. It's been really great discussing this. Hopefully our listeners got a lot out of this as well. And I look forward to having you back. Thanks for having me. If you found this episode or any of our episodes helpful, please make sure to share and leave a rating to help us reach more people on their investing journeys. And of course, subscribe to be notified when new episodes drop. Make sure to follow the podcast on Instagram at Investor Intelligence Podcast. You can find links to our other socials in the show notes, including a link to the Property Mentors weekly blog. If you are ready to get your property portfolio in shape for financial freedom, check out Luke's latest book, Property Fit. You can get yourself a copy at www.propertyfitbook.com.au.